Okay, it's going to be a classic review of Tupac's Me Against the World. Today's June 16th, 2023. Today would have marked the 52nd birthday uh, if Tupac Shakur uh, was still alive. But yeah, you know, June 1671, the day. Uh, that's a very famous line. Uh, so it's easy to remember that uh, this is his birthday. But, you know, I don't know why. I just feel compelled uh, to review this album i'm not really used to doing uh album reviews I've, i find them very difficult but um i don't know it almost feels like there's a higher power just telling me to talk about uh this album which is it's definitely uh tupac's best work in my opinion it, it's a little bit tougher to make the case that this is the greatest rap album of all time i think you can make that case um but yeah man we're gonna go back to march 14th 1995 that's when it was released i don't think i bought it until like two weeks after then i remember i didn't hear about the album until mtv news ran the um ran the special that it actually uh was number one on the billboard chart um it i think it actually beat out bruce springsteen to sold like 200,000 records the first week eventually it went three and a half times platinum um But yeah, man, I, I mean, the title, Me Against the World, I, I love the title. Uh, they've Obviously, they, they contemplated different names for it. I think um, when you look it up, obviously, the, uh, the alternate title was supposed to be called Fuck the World. That was actually one of the tracks. But I'm glad they went with Me Against the World. They, and no one talks about this, but I, I do remember um, after the shooting at Quad Studios in November of 94, they, the, the original title was supposed to be called Crucial. I don't think anyone I've never seen that documented, but, you know, I do remember that as a kid, like yeah, like that was supposed to be the name of the album. But I'm glad they changed it. I think Me Against the World is a great album title. You could definitely argue that there's a lot of um, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to say go check out this album. This album is not for everybody, though. You know, it deals with depression, suicide anger it, it really is a very heavy album but i i like it because I, I feel like it's authentic i feel like it's raw i just i feel like this is the real person i think you can make the argument that a lot of the death row stuff was very fabricated you know was definitely designed to um you know sell controversy sell records i i just feel like me against the world is uh you know tupac's best work him at his finest and but i, I do feel like tupac got better with each and every release i, I do feel like you know when he came out of jail I, I thought all eyes on me and everything that was recorded on death row I, I did feel like his delivery and the engineering and the sounds uh definitely got a lot better i think tupac is one of the one of the few rappers that uh, got better with each and every release. You know, rappers like Nas and Snoop, and, you know, maybe even Jay-Z, you, you could definitely argue that they, um, you know, they reached their pinnacle with their debut album. With Tupac, it's definitely the opposite. You you, you definitely saw growth between Tupacalypse Now, the Strictly album, and, and Me Against the World. So, uh, but yeah, this was actually distributed through Interscope Records. If you've seen the Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre um, documentary on Peacock, uh, Jimmy Iovine has framed in his office a letter from Tupac just thanking him for the uh, the budget for the uh, for the record. So, uh, shout out to Jimmy Iovine. This is uh, definitely one of the most uh, you know. This is one of my my favorite albums ever. So without him, you know, maybe that doesn't happen um, because the product the production here is definitely good. It, it definitely feels like a laid back uh, blues record. But but I'll, I'll tell you what, though, like you'd have a tough time um, arguing this is the greatest hip hop record ever. I think that's kind of a that's a tougher case. I think you can make that argument, um, but you'd have an easier case. And most people would agree that this is Tupac's best record. You know, there, there are people that are going to argue that All Eyes on Me, and, and it did. I think All Eyes on Me did have better songs on it, but All Eyes on Me had a lot of filler. It does not f feel as raw and cohesive as Me Against the World. Me Against the World, just it feels like the real person. I think that's what I'm trying to come across here. Okay, let's get down to the track by track review here. All right, the intro tr intro track is great. Um, the engineer here, the producer is Tony Pizarro. He got a lot of credit, um, you know, for this album. Um, but the intro really, it's a collection. The beat is the beat is really really good. I mean, it really kind of makes you think. 
like that that would have been cool if you rapped over that because I, I like the beat but it, it's more of a collage of uh you know news sound bites about tupac um getting in trouble with the law whether it be the um you know the rape case or, or getting shot at just a whole lot of negativity here kind of setting the tone for why he feels like it's uh, me against the world can't trust anybody so you have all these uh you know sound bites here and it, it almost became like a routine you know again every news station had their own uh tupac section of the news of the local news or the newscast so so there you go with that i, I thought i thought the intro was good it is it's a good intro it, it really is um all right next up we have if i died and i produced by easy mo b so they actually recorded this in unique studios which is um you know, down the street from uh, Quad Studios. So I, I guess Tupac was bouncing between two studios in New York. You have Unique, which is where Easy Moby uh, stayed at the most. And then Quad Studios was where he got shot. Uh, he actually recorded the last track at, at Quad, uh, believe it or not. But um, that kind of gives it more of an eerie feeling looking back on it. But um, but yeah, Easy Moby um, worked with Biggie as well. He, he worked with Bad Boy and... He produced the flavor in the ear for Craig Mack. And this is really one of the first producers that rappers started, you know, giving shout outs to, um, you know, in Temptations, you know, Tupac says, yo, Mo B, drop that beat. And at the end, the Machine Gun Funk from Biggie's album, uh, I think at the end of the track, he goes like, Mo B got beats. So, um, yeah, Easy Mo B is, um, you know, great producer. Yeah, he gave Tupac a lot of tracks here uh, for this album and, you know, the, the uh, the My Block from the show soundtrack, some of the songs from Thug Life as well. So they worked a lot at this time. Um, if I Die Tonight got a great sample. Um, there's a lot to say about this track. Very suicidal. It's 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 a little bit heavy, man. Uh, he's he's actually the whole song is like a prophecy. Uh, you know, everything he's talking about. Either he was about to happen, or you know, it's just someone that just you know you could just feel someone just fearing for their life with this track right here you know the, the, the everything that came from fame uh the alliteration here is great too i mean the alliteration here I, i've you never really seen him um you know be this lyrical before and he really just set the tone uh with with the opening track he said pussy and paper is poetry power and pistols plotting on murder murdering motherfuckers before they get you so it's a powerful line there. You see the the P alliteration. There's tons of alliteration throughout this whole track. And um, yeah, I mean, really just kind of touching on the rape situation as well about being, um, you know, not trusting women. Uh, he has a line in there where he's talking about the game should be sold instead of trying to pay women for sex. You know, you should, you know, you know, make them pay for it by having game or having enough intelligence to, uh, you know, not ha not be able to put yourself in those positions. So it's a very heavy track, um, you know, from a lyrical standpoint. You know, this is this is the most lyrical I think he's ever sounded. And it, it does sound great. So so l l let me take you back to uh, 1995. So I remember playing the album in the street in the neighborhood and grew up around, around a lot of older guys that were headbangers. And one of the guys actually said, you know, the track sucks. He's like, oh, man, this sucks. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with him, though. Like, I'm trying to, like, listen to it from his ear. So if you just put this on without dice, without being ready for it or dissecting the lyrics, it can come, come off a little bit heavy, like, if you're not really expecting it. And just the way he was flowing here, it, it's very complex. Uh, it, it's very poetic. But it, it, it's, it's, al it's almost like... Um, <sighs> It's an unfamiliar rhyme pattern that Tupac was using here. And, you know, there are rumors that, you know, the track was ghostwritten for him because he was going back and forth from court. I'm really not buying that, though. When, 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 I, when I look at these lyrics here, it, it's got Tupac's fingerprints all over him. Uh, but there are some writers here uh, credited. There, there's rumors that Tretch was actually involved uh, with helping him out. You know, uh, obviously, he didn't have a lot of time bouncing back and forth from court. But, yeah, you, you got about four or five names uh, taking credit for writing this thing here. I think a lot of it has to do with the sampling as well. But it's a great sample. You know, Jay-Z has used the sample before. I think if I die tonight, it's 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 definitely going to go down as, you know, lyrically some of his, you know, lyrically, you know, probably uh, some of his best work. But I, I, I will agree, though. I, I think it was Carcino that was saying this on YouTube 
the the last verse it, it feels like it's Tupac solely by himself. It does feel like the first two verses. Uh, it's a little bit bit of a different rhyme scheme. Very very complex. So I will say that, but it's it's an awesome track and it's very heavy as well. I think Easy Mo B was even saying that he was taken aback by just how um, you know suicidal the track felt because you know you, you, you don't want to be you know helping somebody commit suicide. So you have that going on there. All right, next up we have Me Against the World featuring Dramacidal at the time, who actually would become uh, the Outlaws. This is actually produced by uh, Soul Shock and, and Carlin. I believe they use the Isaac Hayes sample "Walk On By." There's actually like a, tri a very similar to a Tribe Called Quest the lyrics to go sample here as well you could definitely feel that looking back on it but yeah me against the world um the title track here this was actually on the bad boys soundtrack and i don't know why i that it kind of it kind of bothers me that it was on the bad boys soundtrack like when I, when i when they first used it in bad boys I, I wasn't really you know crazy about the track but i think within the context of this album um it just works a lot better but you can't blame Tupac. I mean, they probably gave him what, like fifty thousand dollars just to use that, the track, on the soundtrack. But um, uh, see, this this is one song where the Me Against the World track, like, you got to use you got to use it the right way. Like everything has got to be set, the levels got to be set right, the speakers got to be set right. But if you use this track in a movie at the right time, it can be very very powerful. Um, this is definitely some of the most insightful he's ever been. You know, he's talking about, um, he's basically giving people advice here. He's talking about politicians and hypocrites that they don't want to listen. He's talking about fame, you know, driving him insane. And, um, you know, just all the violence that he's has, has seen has corrupted himself and just feels like it's me against the world. It's, it's definitely an uplifting track. This, this, this is the track where you can say to yourself, like, he feels like he's, a father figure here, you know, just by the way he's, you know, talking to people. Like, how many rappers have ever had the balls to actually, you know, give give people advice? Always do your best. And when the pressure gets stranded and things don't go the way you plan, dreaming of riches in a position of making a difference. Politicians and hypocrites, they don't want to listen. If I'm in fame, it's the if I'm insane, it's the fame that made me change. It went nothing like the game. It's just me against the world. It's it's a great trap. My brother doesn't like uh the the dramacidal feature but you know th there is one dope line from uh the outlaws here he said um so what the pussy working i make my mail making sales risking 25 with an l but oh well um you know kind of a reference to um you know risking his life by selling drugs and 25 years to life um i thought that was actually uh a really dope line from them but you know what what what, what the feature did was it really kind of gave tupac a break and he can just you know hit a home run with the intro verse and the final verse as well so uh, i i love the track i think this is like a top three you know tupac song it doesn't it seems like a lot of people uh don't give it the same love that i do but next up we're going to move to the most popular track on the album this is so many tears uh, the Flizno Production Squad, uh, produced by a lot of different guys, produced the song. I believe G Sh G Shock from the um, from Digital Underground actually helped produce this as well. God, just the this fucking beat right here is uh, incredible, and I appreciate it a lot more now uh, than I did as a kid. Um, this is the uh, this is the song of the album where you can, you can really get the blues influence. It, it feels like a blues record. Um, really, Tupac kind of feels like he's a little bit laid back here. It's almost like he's he's at he's at a lounge smoking a cigar, just feeling depressed, but not really, you know, showing too much emotion. Not really yelling and screaming into the mic like he's done at times in the past, like a fuck the world track or a hit him up track. This is him just kind of reminiscing and just being suicidal. Uh, you know, my, my favorite track, my favorite line on the song is I'm, I'm suicidal. So don't stand, stand near me. My every move is a calculated step to bring me closer to engaging in an early death. Now there's nothing left. It's just, you could just really feel his pain. Um, at the time, uh, his friend, uh, Cato, uh, have passed away, but but I'll tell you what, man. Like 
he performed this song at the House of Blues, and it, it had a, it had such a different energy to it. Like he was yelling into the mic, and then by the time it came, I don't know if he forgot the lines, but when when it came to the Cato reference, he stopped. He stopped the song, and then he went to hit him up. He's like, "I got something new for you. I got to hit him up." But yeah, what an awkward transition that was. But uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it had something to do with falling. Uh, at the time, Cato was actually uh, brothers with Stretch, and I think he had a uh, a beef with the the rapper named Stretch uh, at the time. Who I think I think he actually passed away um, as well. So it, it's it's just a very you know suicidal driven track. Um, really just feeling hopeless like th there's another there's another line of the song where he says i've been i've been really wanting babies so i could see a part of me that wasn't always shady don't trust my lady because she's a product of this poison so that's a really interesting track about you know basically implying that he would love to have kids one day but he's hesitant to do it because you know because of um you know, he knows that it's going to come with a lot of baggage because of the wife and, you know, whoever it is, you know, there's just a lack of trust there. So I thought that was really interesting. But um, yeah, man, it's so many tears is a great track. So from a personal standpoint, I remember in my dorm room, uh, someone heard me playing this and he's like, man, he, he, the guy was actually on the basketball team. He's like, you, pl you play a lot of records. I'm like, so you have anything I can listen to? And I actually had a, a backup copy of this burn so i actually gave it to him and i'll tell you i kid you not the dude like every single day like he was playing this is the only track he would play from the album like he was playing this every day so he could definitely relate to it so i think anybody that was going that was under a lot of pressure or or someone that was just you know stressed uh it's, it's definitely one of those songs that could definitely relieve stress because it, it's relaxing but at the same time it's very um it's very personal as well so that's so many tears and the beat was great too man how they chopped this up with the soul sample and the blues sample i think it's actually a stevie wonder sample if i'm not mistaken but uh yeah so many tears is, is a great track so next up we move on to temptation which is another track produced by easy moby so he actually flipped the computer love sample and then he combined it with an eric sermon um so Eric Sermon's actually the producer for Redman. It was on Redman's solo uh, debut. He was just kind of just, you know, kind of just singing into the mic, just kind of playing around. And it actually, it actually worked for this track. It just worked for the hook. Uh, but Temptations, I think Biggie would have sounded great over this track. See, this is the one track where if Biggie or Puffy was a little bit jealous that that he got the beat for this. Um, I could see why. I, th I think I think the the beat would have actually fit, you know, more of an up tempo Biggie beat than this one. But here, Tupac is a little bit more laid back. This is more of a radio friendly track. See, this is like the type of track I would love to hear on the radio because um, you know there, it's it's got a little bit of that those R and B hooks. It's it's a little bit fan friendly, but at the same time, it, it Tupac comes across very soft spoken, very romantic. Um, this was supposed to be a video one of the first videos that they filmed for the uh, album, but because he had to go to uh, to, to prison, uh, a lot of rappers came together. Tretch from Naughty by Nature, Coolio, uh, I think, uh, Jada Pinkett, I think, was supposed to... No, I think she was in the video. She was supposed to direct uh, Can You Get Away, but, yeah, Coolio is actually playing the, uh, the bellboy uh, from the hotel here, so it was a really, really fun video, but... You know, it's 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 not like one of my favorite tracks from the album, but um, it definitely has probably the most commercial appeal. And uh, yeah, I think I, I think I think the the track would have came off a lot better, uh, you know, different, I would say, uh, had Biggie gotten this beat. But, you know, what what this track is, it, it's more of a mature version of I think I get around uh, from from his previous album. Uh, next up, we have Young, N-I-G-G-A-Z. Um, this track is produced by Mose, Mose MD and the Funky Drummer. The sample here worked really, really well. Um, okay, so with this track right here, th this might go down as the most underrated track on the album. This The track, I don't think it gets a lot of love uh, in, in the Tupac uh, catalog. Um 
so at the beginning of the track, he actually shouts out an 11 year old that got killed uh, from gang banging. So he's talking about like, you know, he, at the time, Tupac is young uh, when he recorded this song. He's only 23 years old, but he's talking to really, really young dudes at the time like 11 year old kids that start gang banging out of the blue and end up getting killed so there was there was a kid from chicago i think his name was robert zandifer and he got killed from gang banging at 11 years old so he's just telling everybody like you know to be young you have uh you know so much uh to hope for he said don't don't destroy your life before it even begins by uh you know gang banging and selling selling drugs um so that's kind of the, the theme of the whole thing. But it's ironic, though, because he, he sounds like he's very anti-gangbanging. Uh, but then, you know, when he's with Suge, you know, he, he's, he's basically associating with Pyru Bloods. And, um, you know, he ended, ended up getting killed by a crip in Orlando Anderson. So, you know, you could definitely make the argument that he didn't practice what he preached here. But um, it's got a hell of a message to it. And I I I, th I, th I thought it was really really good, man. I mean the the, the sample was great, and the uh, the uh, the the chorus is I I thought it wor worked really really well on that track. All right, next one we're moving on to "Heavy in the Game" featuring Richie Rich. So I I think that's another underrated thing that makes the album great. The album is very multi-dimensional in terms of uh, having sounds from all over the all over the nation. So, yeah, like a lot of the tracks were actually recorded in New York, but, you know, a lot of them were recorded in California as well. You know, Heavy in the Game is, um, you know, th this is really more of an Oakland sound. He almost has like the loyal to the game type of flow here that he had on the Above the Rim soundtrack. And, uh, you know, even though he was at one point MC New York, he does credit, you know, Oakland for really you know, changing his style and, uh, you know, teaching him about uh, the game. So heavy in the game, he's actually, he's basically playing like a drug dealer here that was successful and just, you know, the perspective of someone that was uh, enjoying the life of, um, you know, being a, being a drug dealer. Um, you know, the hook is like the game being good to me. So, um, and you got Richie Rich uh, as, as a guest uh, feature here. He's actually from the Bay Area. And um, I thought they had good chemistry here. I, I thought this was a nice change of pace. It just had a West Coast driven beat produced by Mike Mosley and Sam Bostic. I thought it was good, man. It, it, it definitely is good. It, it's def, you know, in the documentaries, you learn to know that Tupac did not enjoy selling drugs. His heart really wasn't in it. Uh, I, I think the, the guy actually said that they were like the worst drug dealers in the world because, you know, they, they, they were like the only ones that weren't, weren't really making any profits off of selling crack. So, uh, but yeah, but you, you get the point. It's, it's from the perspective of someone that was heavy in the game, um, heavy into the, the lifestyle. So, so there you go. All right, next up we have Lord Knows. <sighs> This is produced by Brian G, Mo, Mo ZMD, and Tony Pizarro. God, the, the sample here, they really flipped the sample and just made it uh, very fast-paced, very paranoia. Uh, so this is the most suicidal track on the album. He just feels like he's about to commit suicide. He, he's talking about getting lost in the weed to take his mind off of all of the... Uh, uh, anxiety, you know, losing people from gang banging, losing, losing friends that got shot, you know, just the PTSD syndrome. This is a song where you can really, really feel his pain. And, uh, yeah, I think the track is great. Like to, to me, this is, this is easily uh, a top 20 track from him. And I'll, I'll tell you, man, this, this is a track that I will, and it, it works perfect. Obviously I've never been shot at, you know, I've, I've been punched in the face at the park. Um, I'm trying to think of whatever what else happened but i've never had to deal with you know someone uh you know trying to kill me in terms of uh you know gun violence or anything like that but but i'll tell you what the track does though the, like it's hard to relate to some of the stuff that he's talking about but i do remember vividly being on a bus just being in a really really bad shooting slump with my aau team um and it, it was it was at a point where you know the really really weird situation where the, the the coach wanted to bring in his stepson who quit the team he wanted to bring him back to the team then we had 
you know, some of the football players I talked about in the past were, you know, contemplating quitting and I just wasn't playing well as well. And I just, I just could really relate to the song. I just, I felt like a lot of pressure at the time. And for whatever reason, the, the song just kind of, you know, it, it, it can, it can, it just, it just brought you back to life. It really did. It just, it just slaps you upside the face. I mean, it's harsh, but sometimes when you're playing a competitive sport, and, you know, to use an NBA analogy, when you got a coach like Riley, uh, you know, insulting you and trying to, you know, bring the best out of you, you know, it, uh, you know, tracks like this can really, um, you know, it really hits you in the heart and it, it could dig deep. So I think that's what this track has. I, there's very few tracks that, you know, can connect to you like that and just make you that much more competitive. And I think the Lord knows is definitely one of those tracks. Um Great beat as well, man. Awesome beat. And then we have Dear Mama, the tearjerker of the album. This is uh, this is produced by Brian G. Mo Mo ZMD and, and Tony Pizarro is the engineer here. Uh, you've heard this sample uh, before in hip hop. Like if you are a big hip hop fan, De La Soul actually used this sample on one of the many skits uh, from De La Soul is Dead. Um. Yeah, but Dear Mama is is a great song. This is the first video. Tupac wasn't able to be in the video, but uh, you know the the song means a lot to me. It affected a lot of people. You know, even some of the headbangers that I talked about that weren't really into uh, rap. I think everyone appreciated the songwriting, uh, how he poured his heart, how you know Tupac poured his heart out into the song to uh, pay respect to his mother, who was uh, a single parent. Uh, that was a Black Panther, uh, and even though she was experimenting with, um, you know, drinking and, and drugs, um, you know, he's he's able to reflect and you know put a positive spin to it. You know, there's there's a lot of negative feelings, but the positives definitely outweigh the negatives, and uh, you know, just you know, pays tribute to his mother for for being a single mother and, and raising him. Um, you know, the right way. And I, it's a song that, you know, not, not just, you know, little black kids uh, can relate to this song. You know, I, you know, white kids can relate to it as well. You know, um, you know, I was raised by a single mother. You know, my father was not there, you know, when I was uh, in elementary school. You know, he was totally out of the picture. And my mother, uh, same situation. You know, she grew up without a father. And a, a lot of times, it's the mother that just... You know, sometimes the father doesn't want to leave, but he's forced out. And that's exactly what happened with my mother. And it definitely affected her. And I'll tell you, he talks about how, you know, he actually mentioned his dad in this song. And at the time, I think he he had he was under the impression that his dad was dead. He's like, no love for my from my daddy because the coward wasn't there. He passed away and I didn't cry because my anger didn't let me feel for a stranger. Uh, so it's funny, like, like he, he didn't, he didn't meet his father, I believe until he had gotten shot. So when he wrote the song, he thought he had already, you know, passed away. But, um, I think Afini Shakur, you know, she just, she wanted, I, I think, you know, it's one of those situations where if it's not working out, you just want to distance yourself, uh, from the biological father. And my, my grandmother did the same thing. You know, I've, I've asked my grandmother time and time again, like, I wanted to find out more about my grandfather. I think his name was John Pately. I think he changed his name from Patelis to Paintley. And so I, I was like, so grandma, t tell me what Pately was like. And, and she would, she would never give me any information. She would just be like, why do you want to know? He was no good. Like, that's all she would say to me. But I, I, I saw that it affected my mother a lot worse then it affected my aunt and my uncle who were just kind of nonchalant with it. You know, we'll never know how much it affected them, but it does affect you. And Tupac has talked about time and time again how um, it definitely hurt his confidence not to have that male uh, father figure. And, and I would definitely agree with that. You know, it, 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 I, in, in some cases, I think it's even worse. Like when, when the father, you know, cheats on the wife and, you know, has the option and is clearly not happy and goes away it, it definitely does affect you um you know I, I just think looking back on it the 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 challenge is can you be strong enough to overcome it you know 
can, can you be strong enough to overcome it in time? And, you know, you could definitely argue that, you know, someone like me wasn't, you know, I didn't know how to eat right. I didn't know how to train right at an early age. So it probably definitely did affect me, you know, earlier on. But, you know, there's a way to overcome it if you can, you know, work hard enough and, and um, you know, just be, you know, get to a certain level on time, bef- you know, so it doesn't affect you. But that's the challenge of it. Can 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 you do it on time? And you know, but um, but back to this track right here, man. Dear Mama, it's 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 a great track. Uh, it, it, I don't. You see, th- this is the type of stuff that you can just never get today. And um, you know, someone just really just getting that personal and that deep, and. Um, it's it's almost too good. It, it, like the, the the song is so good that you you almost feel guilty about playing it because it it, it just feels so um, natural. But you know, Afeni Shakur definitely had a bad side, and I, I think that that goes with every case. A, anytime you you're very close to somebody, like if you don't have like a love hate relationship with them, then it's probably not that great of a relationship. I saw Dwayne Wade actually saying about pat riley he he said if if you know to love pat riley you have to hate him as well so it's the same it's probably the same thing went on with the mother the mother was no saint she was a black panther and you know she she was addicted to drugs but there's also a very good side to his mother and my mother as well like my mother has a, a very very dark side to her very emotional reckless side to her but at the same time it's like you know there's nobody like your mother so, you know, when, when, when you say to yourself, man, can you see anybody else filling that void? And most times you just can't see it. So Dear Mama is a great track. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people are going to say that this is, you know, by far uh, their favorite Tupac song because they can relate to it. Anybody can relate to it. You know, my brother loved the song. Everybody loved it. And there's just so there's so many other lines that just really stand out. Even about you know because the father wasn't there, there, you know, you know the, the the drug dealers. The line about the drug dealers, and even though they're slang drugs, they show the young brother love. That just showed you that there's always another side to people. Like yeah, even though these people are doing fucked up things, there is a good side to them as well. So I think that's, you know, just little stuff like that really makes that track stand out as well. It's not just about his mother. Um, it Ain't Easy was great, man. It Ain't Easy is, is a really just, you could just feel this young kid, 23 years old, on the verge of going to prison, just very anxious, nervous, and scared. You know, It Ain't Easy, will I see the penitentiary or will I stay free? It's like, it's almost like contemplating like, man. Like you could just feel his pain. Like you could just—he's talking about the uh, the judge got a grudge. He won't post no bail. He's going on a long vacation. So by the end of the song, he talks about possibly going to prison as almost a vacation, almost like an escape. You know, maybe just an escape away from the courtroom. Maybe just an escape away from um, you know the pressure to you know record and make classics. I don't know what he's talking about there, but you know. But, you know, if, if if you talk to him about going to prison, he he, he would say it's not a vacation. Like you can die in prison. But in a way, I, I think I think being in prison, I think he learned a lot. I think more than anything, when when Tupac did go to a Clinton Correctional Facility, I think he learned a lot. I think uh, it exposed him to different, you know, styles, different different people from around the country. And I think, you know, after he came out of jail, I, you, you could definitely feel, especially like in the Machiavelli album, I think he connected with a lot more people in the South and other parts of the, the nation, especially away from New York. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, but can you get away? Um, uh, so this is the video that Jada Pinkett was supposed to direct had he not went to jail. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess that it's I'm really not crazy about this track. I think it's okay. It's probably the weak link of the album, like from my point of view. Um, but it's actually about Lisa Left Eye Lopez from TLC. At the time, she was actually, I think she was married to Andre Risen from the Falcons, who was a wide receiver for them. And she was actually getting beat up and, 
you know, had to go to the hospital. Like, why are you always wearing glasses? Why do you, why is your eye always patched up? And um, so apparently, like, they had a love at first sight type of relationship. And um, she was actually contemplating leaving him uh, to get with Tupac. But I guess because they're on both different coasts, uh, they never really got a chance to uh, uh explore it but yeah i mean it, it's it's pretty i could have definitely appreciate it more now that i know it's it's strictly about her i thought it was a little bit fabricated when i first listened to it about how he's talking about you know why are you going to the hospital or why are you getting beaten up on because you know the the guy that he ended up spending so much time with at death row was guilty of doing stuff like that as well like suge you know suge was known to be a bully so it's like, all right, well, why would you make a song like that and then spend so much time with Suge? But, um, but it was cool though. Like it's it, it's 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 a soulful track. I think his heart was definitely in it. You know, the the R and B hook is what it is. It's definitely like the it's definitely like the female track of the album. Um, it's a lot better than Masterpiece version of it. God, Masterpiece version of it you know when you compare it to this version it, it makes you appreciate it that much more i'll definitely say that uh all right next up we have the old school so this is the opposite of hit him up so hit him up was like a fuck you to the east coast to current rappers on the east coast this is a uh shout out to you know rappers from the 80s that helped pave the way whether it be eric b and rakim uh mr magic uh big daddy kane de la soul LL Cool J. It's funny a lot. Some of these rappers he actually started dissing when he came out of jail. I think LL Cool J and De La Soul. De La Soul actually dissed Tupac on "The Stakes Is High." He said so many rappers spending time about who they hated. That's why the native tongues have officially been reinstated. And I, even in this track right here, yeah, he even said that LL used to be a battle rapper, and that didn't really last long. He said something like that, but it was cool, man. You could definitely see his passion for the old school. It's a nice change of pace. It's nice to get away from the paranoia, the suicidal flow, the anxieties here. And uh, yeah, he just kind of let it out of the bag about how much he reminisced. You know, just the, uh, you know, playing manhunt, chasing down the ice cream truck, you know, playing stickball, just different things associated with, you know, all these guys that inspired him to start rapping. I would definitely say, like, if if I were to pick one rapper that Tupac really kind of emulated in the early days, at least, it'd probably be like Big Daddy Kane and Rakim uh, mixed in the one. And he ends the track with saying, I said it before, I came in the door, said it before, that was the shit. That was the, uh, the Rakim line. I came in the door, said it before, never let the mic magnetize me no more. So, yeah, old school. I got to say, who, who produces Soul, so Soul Shock, JB, and Easy Cut? All right. Um, great beat right here. Great sample. And I, I like how the beat kind of, you know, adjusts to Tupac. Like when he's like, I can't explain how it was. Houdini had me buzz and there it was you know talking about hopping on the trains it, it really is this is like the most new york track tupac had ever done uh and it's just funny man he, he when he went to baltimore he actually called himself mc new york uh but man so he went from mc new york to uh you know the poster board for the west coast it's, it's really really interesting all right so fuck the world is really just a shout out the media and, and it's funny man i don't know if i touched on it yet but when, the first time I tried to buy a, a Tupac uh, album or, or song, it was actually, I tried to buy the I Get Around single. So I, I remember when I went to the record store, actually the day I bought Illmatic, so I got Illmatic on tape. And then I said, by the way, can, can I get the Tupac single if you have it? I Get Around. And the guy just said to me, we, we don't sell Tupac records here. It's almost, it, you almost get the feeling like the cop incident when he killed the two off-duty uh, cops for harassing somebody it's almost like he had such a bad image on um in the media that it kind of trickled down to some of the record stores just boycotting his music and yeah i saw i always thought that kind of sucked i'm like you don't have any tupac anything at the time he only had two albums out but but still but yeah fuck the world is just an f you to the media it's just an f you to you know some of the women that uh turned against him and uh, yeah, I, I think that that's another like really underrated thing about this album is like, yeah, he loves uh, women and eventually he wants to have a happy home. And at the same time, he's still fighting off the weakness of being promiscuous. 
but it's 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 a, a lot about just trust you know t- trusting women and um just not being able to trust them so you know fuck the world fuck the media um this is definitely the most angry he is on the album there's other tracks that he did at death row that kind of matched this hostility and this anger this is very overproduced it's actually shock g that produces it here but uh yeah man just 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 a lot of different sounds going on here but um but yeah man i I thought the track was dope uh i'm just glad that they didn't call the album fuck the world though i think me against the world's a lot better but me there's a there's a big difference though between me against the world and uh fuck the world fuck the world is just a flat out f you to just everybody that you know was misinterpreting you know what he was going through because you know obviously he put himself in some fucked up situations but the bottom line is he's not a rapist yeah he actually starts a song with who you call him rapist so he's definitely not a rapist he's definitely not um you know someone that sold drugs or advocated for violence or anything like that um uh, and that leads us to death around the corner death around the corner uh, produced by Johnny J. He will work with Johnny J. a lot uh, during the Death Row days, but um, and this is really, it really is the same type of beat from uh, Picture Me Rolling. It's it's almost identical in terms of the beat. The, the lyrics sound a little bit drowned out here, uh, but yeah, this came off great. So he's trying to paint a picture of Malcolm X in the beginning of this thing he's like you just walk you just look out the fu-. so there's a woman there just kind of yelling at him you just look at the fucking window with that fucking AK all day you don't work you don't fuck you don't do a goddamn thing and then it's like I see death around the corner gotta stay hard to survive in the city where the skinny people die so um yeah death around the corner is, is it's definitely a great track uh once again he feels suicidal here um and you can feel the anger come out of him as as well. But um, really, this is the track that really kind of gets you thinking about the death threats. You know, it's like someone that had that many death threats, whether it be from, you know, people he associated with in the street, you know, people that he hustled with or people, uh, you know, just just people from the government just trying to shut him down. Um, obviously, he had ties to the Black Panther. So the Black Panther Party with his mother. So obviously that might come into play as well but yeah death around the corner he just gets angrier and angrier as the track goes on and then there's some really really nice you know quotes from movies at the end of this thing um there's a scene from the untouchables uh i I forget the actor's name but he's like i want that son of a bitch dead i want his family dead i want his family dead so the very very cinematic feel uh Lots of pictures painted here, and obviously you think of Malcolm X here. There's a famous pi- picture with Malcolm X looking out the window as he's, um, as he knows that death is around the corner and he's probably going to die. So it's it's that's that's the other thing about this album too. It's it's almost like a prophecy. It's very prophetic in terms of uh, you know predicting your own death. Uh, know it's around the corner, but you know what 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 I think kind of goes under the radar here is is some of the quotes at the end of the album where he's talking about um you know real people pick when they go when they get to go so that's that kind of you know stood out as well he's basically saying don't be a pussy live your life um you know you'll you'll decide like when you go but um obviously when you live that type of you know lifestyle um and i i just i just think you know just associating with so many different people um you know just it just led to it led to him just dying like that you know um you know obviously he made a lot of mistakes but you know he 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 did i basically really is pointing out that He's not a coward, and he's going to live his life to the fullest. I, I think that's what he was trying to, to, to showcase at the end of the track. And then we get to the final track. We have Outlaw with Dom- Dramacidal as a feature here. So he's actually talking to a kid named Ra-Ra from uh, New York, 11 years old. I really didn't care for this, the whole interaction with the 11-year-old kid. And it, it's really, really eerie, too, because I, I was 11 when I bought this album. Um but the i think the interaction with the kid i think he was just trying to show um i think he was trying to mock the men the mentality 
where he's he's talking to this young kid and he 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 wants to start hustling he start wants to start living that lifestyle and um yeah so i just i just think i think that was the whole point of it and apparently the kid's mother was upset that he was on the album because of the the nature of the track outlaw was actually recorded very eerie it was actually recorded in quad studios um which is where tupac was shot at so that that's really interesting but yeah th this outlaw track I, I gotta say like this this it's pretty damn good it's you, you almost get the feeling like this was recorded right before he got shot i think he even he even kind of talked about how you know people in mass were going to come up and you know plot to have him killed and you know th there was a conspiracy there so apparently that happened before he wrote this before it actually happened but um wow man it's just, it's just crazy but outlaw it, it almost feels like he wanted to close out the album on a very somber note as someone that's preparing to go away to jail and he's just talking about how um you know they label me an outlaw because uh, you know that's the way society you know forced me to go so it, it almost has like a very somber uh note to it it's not a really exciting song it's it's really not an uplifting way to close out the album but i think i definitely think you could definitely argue that is very fitting it, it it definitely fits the theme of the album and I, I think at the time he was talking about thug life being dead and you know thug life you know he had some issues with some of the guys from thug life including stretch who i believe uh passed away um and he wanted to transition to outlaws out, to outlaws so eventually drama Sado became the outlaw immortals so it kind of sets the tone for the metamorphosis uh from thug life to the outlaws so so there we go with that but yeah man that's me against the world uh i th i just think this is this is some of the most personal shit you could ever you know listen to on an album i i no, no one's ever gotten this personal before and that's what i think makes it just you know fascinating um but um Before we uh, close out, I want to read the review from the source. All right, so when this um, review came out in the source in the spring of 1995, uh, it only got four mics. You know, and, and at the time, I, I would say that that's, I, I think that's a fair rating. You know, you see DJ Quick right there. It almost it almost feels like they thought the Quick album was superior to this. Um, but yeah, I, I think four mics is fine uh, at that time. Like it, it's it, it's not going to blow you away on the first listen. I think the production is it's soulful. It, it feels like a blues album, but the production is you know it, it's it's nowhere near as exciting as i would say ready to die the chronic or doggy style or, or even illmatic it, i mean it's just not but the production was on point all those guys helped him out i mean you, you you saw like a lot of producers there that i named that aren't very well known i mean really it's mostly engineers and you know easy mo b is really the only one that has you know any sort of reputation as a beat maker um, but I just want to read the uh, review because it's kind of it's kind of rare that 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 you can find these. Um, I don't have the whole thing here, but let's get right down to it. So we got four mics. Uh, uncontrolled rage, frustration, and lack of direction uh, pretty much describe Tupac and the focus from his previous albums. Really, um, though the material was reflective of the modern madness that constantly surrounds hip-hop's outlaw it's also reflective of the direction he and his music were taking both albums show flashes of brilliance contained with incredible hits but other songs lacked the musical depth of his best songs radio friendly or not and as many agree Subject matter and content have never been the problem with Tupac's albums. Just the beats and erratic 
song sequence. All right, so I just upload that interlude, uh, something to die for. So I, I could completely understand if some people were a little bit like, well, what the fuck is this? And I, I played that interlude for people and they just did not get it. They they were a little bit confused by it. He's kind of, he kind of had that alternate soldier uh, persona on that track. So some people don't like the abrasive um, kind of, what do you want to call it? You know, awkwardness of the, the interludes at times. All right, true Tupac fans may have noticed his gradual musical progression from one album to the next, including his guest appearances on other albums and his latest, Me Against the World. Follow suit as he releases his best work by far. Lyrically, was never a slouch, but this time his anger, love, and thug life philosophy are stronger Musically, each, and we can't find the end of the review, but you get the point right there. So it's almost like the mentality was that Tupac was inconsistent at delivering great albums. But you could definitely feel that the first two albums definitely have moments of greatness on them. But with Me Against the World, he was able to knock it out of the park and hit a cohesive home run with the entire thing and i i would definitely agree with that but um but yeah man I, I don't know how this came out um like i said man track by track reviews in depth uh, i find them extremely difficult to do i mean you would th I, I would think this came off a little bit better than the absol one because with absol's uh latest album last christmas um I listened to the album about about 10 times and did the review. But with this here, I grew up with Me Against the World. Me Against the World is an album uh, I've been listening to every single year since the fifth grade. So Tupac's birthday, I figured it'd be a good time to, to do it. Um, but yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm glad I dug into it though. Like it's, you know, the review probably didn't come out great or anything like that, but I'm glad I really dug into it. I, I don't think I've ever really appreciated just how harsh the album is and just how, um, you know, and I, I would say, man, like if you have a good life and, and you, everything is going great, maybe don't listen to this album, but maybe, maybe just stay away from it. Maybe it'll corrupt you. But uh, but yeah, you you could definitely like I, I don't think I've ever heard someone get this personal before, you know, just talking about suicide, death, and fear, anxiety, and and you know, just predicting his own death, and 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 talking about stuff that was you know about to happen to him. But you know, I think everything that he was going through at the time, you, you could definitely understand it. Like if you had to go to trial every single day and you know, were facing, you know, multiple years. Obviously, he ended up violating his probation. He was found not guilty of, you know, gang rape. He actually fell asleep and, you know, something might have happened. But, you know, in terms of him, he obviously he would never rape anybody like that. You know, the woman had oral sex with him on the dance floor before anything happened. So, uh, but yeah, no, he would never like, you know, kill anybody if they didn't deserve to be killed. He wasn't that type of person. But, you know, he just I just think he put himself in a lot of bad situations, you know. So, but, you know, any any time you shoot a, a police officer, you're always going to get a bad rap. But when, when you know the whole story, so if, if the, the story was the off duty cops were harassing a black kid uh, for no reason and he shot him in the ass. So that sounds a lot better than just. You know him going up to a police officer and shooting shooting them for no reason so um but yeah but you, you get the point someone that's on trial for rape someone that had just gotten robbed and shot at and you know someone like yeah especially dealing with someone like puffy you know you, you never know with him and then obviously at the same time he he talked about haitian jack you know the dude that um you know, inspired him to do the above the rim, you know, the, that criminal, that that character, that really, really, you know, bad, evil drug dealer character. You know, he was associating himself with uh, Haitian Jack. So anytime you associate with people like that, it's, it's always going to come back to bite you in the ass. Not to mention Jimmy Henchman and King Tut and, you know, the guys that did rob him. Um, you know, it's it's just an unfortunate situation that he was he was going through so much at the time. But 
But yeah, um, aside from all the rawness and uh, you know trials and tribulations that he was going through, I, th- I think the other thing that makes the album great is it's kind of tough to classify it as strictly West Coast or strictly East Coast in a time where everything was just getting classified into you know East or West. Is the East Coast is a West Coast? It's not an East Coast album. It's not a West Coast album. It's a universal album, and I think I think that's another thing that that just makes it very very unique. You know, especially for that time. <laughs> 